Uh, we are recording tonight's session, so you'll get a little pop up about that. But welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fifth installation of the Everyone Can Garden series, uh, a series that focuses on gardening for people with uh, a variety of types of bodies, including various limitations. Uh, this time, we're going to be talking about what we learned about over the course of the growing season this year. Uh, how do we uh, deal with what's left of our gardens? And um, how do we use what we learned this year to prepare for next year to be even better? My name is Leo Taylor. I am one of the uh, hosts of this event, but not one of the presenters. Uh, I am in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Is there a next slide about that office, our office? Oh, no, about the sessions. Okay, um, a, a little bit more about, the, okay, well, the Office of Diverse Equity and Inclusion. Which way do you want me to go, Leo, here? Uh, yes, yeah, we, we can do it either way. This is fine. <laughs> um, oh, the, the joys of having, you know, co-pilots, one person being the, the slide advancer. Uh, all sessions are recorded or have been recorded tonight, you know, included. And eventually they will be available on YouTube as well as on a couple of the websites, I believe that Ohio Agribility being one of them. Um, and I will make sure that everyone who attended one of these sessions receives an email containing the link and the information about the uh, online series. I know that several people were not able to make it and uh, are hopeful to get the, their hands on those videos. Um, we do have to process them though for closed captioning so please be patient. Uh, you are welcome to use chat throughout the session tonight to engage with everyone present, participants as well as presenters. Please note which option you're selecting though when you actually do select uh, a recipient, whether you're sending it to just the panelists or whether you're sending it to everyone. We have some pre-submitted questions that we'll try to get through, uh, through at the end if they're not answered in the course of the session. And then uh, I'll be sharing a link uh, as well as a QR code to a survey to get your feedback about your experience tonight. So watch for that link and as well as a follow-up email from me. Next slide. As I started to mention, my, my office is the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and it's embedded within the College of Food, Ag and Environmental Sciences. And uh, we maintain policies or, or look at policies for the college, uh, recommendations, put on programming to create an accessible, inclusive, and supportive community for everyone uh, in CFAES, um, as well as through throughout the university and through extension. Next slide. So I'm now going to turn it over to the experts for tonight's program, uh, my colleagues, Laura and Pam and uh, they will um, take it from here. So thanks again for coming. Hi, I'm Laura Ackerman. I am the Disability Services Coordinator for Ohio Agribility and Ohio State University Extension. And within, I'm also in the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Office in the College of Food, Ag and Environmental Sciences. Since the Agribility slide is up, I will tell you about Agribility. Ohio Agribility's mission is to promote success in agriculture for Ohio's farmers and farm families and gardeners who are coping with disability or a long-term health condition. Ohio Agribility provides education and resources to farmers, gardeners, agricultural businesses and groups, health care, education and disability professionals, and anyone who's interested in making farming and gardening safe and accessible. And our website is agrability.osu.edu. That's spelled A G R A B I L I T Y.osu.edu. And here is my colleague, Pam Bennett. Some reason, Laura, some things are going fast, some things are going slow. So <laughs> my, my fingers slow down here. I'm excited to be back again. My name is Pam Bennett, I am an associate professor with Ohio State University Extension. I'm also the State Master Gardener Volunteer Program Director and currently the interim 
Chadwick Arboretum uh, program director. And I have probably over 3,000 Master Gardener volunteers around the state who are able to help you and assist you with answering some of your gardening questions. The program involves 50 hours of training through the extension offices around the state. And then they are giving back 50 hours of service the first year to their community. And if you are interested in this program, you can go to the county. And I've got a, a slide at the end showing your county website where to go um, and check and see if they have a Master Gardener Volunteer Program in their county. We have 64 counties with active Master Gardener Volunteer Programs. And the biggest thing is you learn about horticulture, but you also give back to your community. So we're gonna to talk tonight to wind up the season. And at the beginning of the season, we talked about the goal in vegetable garden is to be successful in your efforts. But most importantly, I think to me is to have fun in this. So Leo is going to launch a poll here. We have a quick question for you. Did you meet your vegetable gardening goals this season? Yes, no, or almost? So if you would take a, a minute to answer that question. And this is new on polls. I haven't seen this before. Is, does there, do you see this, Laura? Does everybody see this, I guess? No? It's new. Yeah, this is new. The I poll? like the updates. Oh, yeah, it does look a little different. Mm. Yeah, I like the updates. So uh, on in terms of this poll, and if you don't see it, type in the chat that you don't see it, but we see it. And so hopefully everybody has seen it on the screen. Um, we see yes. 24%, no, 31%, and 45% of you almost. So that's really great. We're glad to uh, hear that. So Leo, if you wanna stop sharing, now we're gonna ask you to go to the chat box. If you would go ahead and share the results, Leo, so everybody could see it. Oh, I already did. I guess they were seeing it then, that's apparently. Good. Yeah, that's great. This is a new poll, I like it. All right, so biggest thing in vegetable gardening, as I said, is to have fun. So in the chat box, if everybody can find the chat box up at the top or down at the bottom, you see a little bar and it says chat, Q&A participants, click on chat. And as Leo said earlier, click on everyone so that everybody could see. Answer this question or these two questions. What are some of the things that you learned this year? Or what did you wish that you would have done that you did not do? And I didn't wanna put in here, list some of the mistakes that you made, but that's kind of what I'm saying here is what kind of errors did you make in your gardening? Um, for me, I didn't have a chance to keep up with the weeds. So right now I'm really struggling to get the weeds before they go to seed. So if everybody can go to the chat box and we do have it turned on Leo so that everybody can type, right? Yep. Yes. All right, we have a, a very modest group tonight. Nobody's answered. Oh, there we go. We'll give them a second. Yeah. They'll I wish I could have figured out how to keep the groundhog out. Oh, me too. <laughs> Plant a cover crop we're going to talk about tonight. Get rid of Canadian thistles. We might talk about that. Perfect rainfall is better for vegetable than watering. Absolutely. Should have built a deer proof fence. Didn't keep up with weeding. I heard, I hear you there. Raise boxes, rabbits. I had rabbit problems. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Keeping up with soggy. Vine borer, we are going to talk a little bit about that. I have a trick that might help you. Keep up with weeds, the rain that we had. Oh, where the local dogs choose to pee. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Raccoons, weeds, squash plant. Well, we had the, the perfect, perfect year for weeds. I mean, we just, you know, we had rains at just the right time, and that really was great for the garden, but it, unfortunately, it was also great for the weeds. So we're gonna talk about some of these things tonight, kind of look back and you're gonna hear me talk about a journal. You're gonna hear Laura talk about a journal and hopefully you all have realized that a journal and writing some of these things down um, actually is very helpful. Well, Sandy, I'm glad you found good in the bad, the baby bunny eating the beans. So that, that's a, a way to look at it in a positive way, right? All right, as again, we talked about in the very first session, have a plan. Right now is when you plan and you start planning next year's garden. All those comments that you just put in the chat box, all those things could start right now so that next year you start thinking about, okay, what should I do? And then when you start getting excited about gardening in February and March, bring out that journal and start reading through all the challenges because when you get to next year, 
in March, you're excited about gardening, you will forget everything that went wrong this fall and you're likely to do it all over again. Or I'll turn it over to you. And that leads right into the slide up here right now, working in the garden reminders, stretch, no matter what you're doing, stretch. Even if you can't stretch a lot, stretch a little bit and do it throughout the day. And honestly, that's pretty good advice for anything. Stretching is good. Um, paying attention to how you feel. So now it is, and it's been raining today, but it's supposed to get a little bit cooler. So that might make you really excited about getting back out in the garden. Just don't overdo it. I find that if I exert myself one day, whether it's in the garden or working out, I really feel it for a few days after. So just try to save yourself from that. Protect yourself. And again, this is good year round. The sun's out all the time, <clears throat> whether it's really hot like we just had and probably we'll have again or it's cold or it's raining be very pay attention to that don't overexert yourself pay attention to your pain whether that is my back hurts because i'm leaning down too much my hands hurt from doing too much hand pruning um maybe chronic aches and pains don't don't push through pain it doesn't make sense and also when we were just talking about that journal writing down what really worked. Um, I guess I found that when I stretched a lot before, when I stretched before I started and then the middle of it, I was more productive and I had less pain. Write that down because you're not going to remember that next year. Um, we all like to romanticize things and think it's going to take us a lot less time to do something than it will, that it was a lot better last year or 10 years ago, but now is what we got. So write down... <clears throat> What good work habits you had? Was it helpful to stretch? How did it feel when you used particular tools all day? How did it feel when you switched out? So positive things that happened. I spent some time pruning and then I went and I weeded and I kept switching tasks that I wasn't using the same body part or posture all day. And then just think about your end of the day overview. How are you feeling? How's your energy and pain level? If you've really overexerted yourself, pay attention to that and remember, write these things down in your journal. It'll be really good and it'll be fun for you to remember. Going back next year when it's cold in the winter and you're reviewing it, it's nice to look at that. It's, it's always nice to look at things that went well and it's very helpful to look at things that didn't go so well. Okay. So Laura, I was thinking about you all day yesterday. I am <laughs> on vacation this week and I, my vacation is working in the garden. And the two things that I've learned from you this year that have helped me tremendously, and I, they were in my mind all day yesterday. Number one, when I was hoeing, I was leaning over in a weird position and my lower back started, I'm thinking, okay, why am I doing this? Because, you know, so yep. I stood up straight and I started doing it properly. So that helped me. Good. And then number two, the biggest thing, and Laureen Ward just posted it, uh, always switching tasks. Yep. So I almost felt like I, it was a squirrel because I was going here, here, and there, but I started out weeding and then I got the hoe out I was hand weeding. Then I got the hoe out. Then I did a little fertilizing. Then I did a little pruning and I didn't spend probably more than 20 to 30 minutes on each task. And I just made sure because normally I would spend a whole day weeding and just focus on that one thing, but I felt great today. And Good. I think it's because I really paid attention and I did take ibuprofen last night. So that might've helped, but really, and truly I had noticed a big difference just from paying attention to those little tips that you gave. So I Good. learned something through this webinar, that's for sure. I'm glad. So the next session, the next part we're going to talk about is some of the challenges that you might've dealt with. And these, again, we talked about in the very beginning, and it's easy to put them out there in May and say, do this, do this, do this. When we get to the season, we think we forget about the things that we're supposed to be doing. Watering is one of the biggest cultural practices um, that people struggle with at times. And this year, of course, we had really decent rains at the right amount of time, but there were also times when we had three weeks with no water. So that leads to tomatoes cracking, for instance, because when you don't have that even amount of moisture in the soil, they get kind of dry, then all of a sudden they get a heavy rain, and the skins just can't take that sudden burst of growth, kind of like our pants split when we grow, you know, and they just crack. So keeping that soil moisture more even 
is going to help prevent that. So watering is really important. And here's some tips that we already went over. I'm not going to go over those again, but keep in mind, corn, 70% water, potato, 80% water, tomato, 95% water. If they're dry, they're not going to develop properly. And somebody earlier in the chat said that vegetable gardening when it's wet does much better. When it's moist does much better. I had the best peppers ever because they were getting sufficient water over amount of time. So watering is really something that we kind of like put on the back burner and don't think about, but it's really important that we keep that soil level, soil moisture even. I Fertilizing have, again, I, I have some, some Pam, I have something I want to add to watering. Yep, yep, yep. It's something, especially when I'm giving this presentation like this a year and it's 95 to 100 degrees out like it has been and those three or four weeks that it did not water, that's when you have to prioritize and say, because it's it's not safe to stay outside for that long. I don't care how much sunscreen or how many sun hats you have on. It's not safe. So what you need to do then is prioritize. What's the most important thing I've got to do? And I would say if it's dry and it's hot, watering. So put that first. I mean, if it's been raining, you can absolutely move it off, but put that first. And then something that really like I call them bungee hoses but they're those compostable hoses um, if you're not lucky enough to have in-ground irrigation or a great sprinkler set up or if you've got soaker hoses if you were really smart and did that at the beginning of the year those soft lightweight expandable hoses are so important because you're not hauling a big heavy rubber hose on a trolley around I also love the we're not going to go as much into tools, but um, AgriBuildy website, it'll be at the end of the web, at the end of the webinar, I have a handouts and I like those water spray guns that you can lock open. So you just have to, you have to hold it, but you don't have to squeeze it because there's times when you squeeze and squeeze it, it just wears your hand out. So I just Good want to point. with that. Good points on watering, Laura. And I know people say don't water in the middle of the afternoon. Well, first of all, if the plants need it, you need to water anytime. So if the plants are dry, watering in the middle of the afternoon is okay. Watering in the middle of the afternoon does not burn the foliage of the plants. That's not going to hurt the plants, especially if they're dry, they need water. And yes, there will be some evaporation, but if you put the sprinkler out and let it go and you have, you make sure it's hitting the, the garden and not the sidewalk and not the driveway and not, you know, the grass and so forth. If it's hitting the the garden, it's okay to water in the afternoon. I know, I know some people are really adamant about that, but it is okay to water in the middle of the day if it's needed and it's better to water than it is to work out in the heat. That's definitely something I've learned as well, Laura. Fertilizing is also important. Um, you know, if you haven't done a soil test, now is a great time to do it. This will tell you what your plants need next season. The limiting factor in most of our gardens is going to be nitrogen. Typically, we have enough phosphorus and potassium, but a fertilizer, a soil test will tell you exactly what's needed and when and for what crop. And many times people will call and say, well, I haven't, you know, fertilized in several years. What's going on? The plants just aren't getting enough nutrients to grow sufficiently. So keep in mind that fertilizing is an important part of your cultural practice. Somebody mentioned staking earlier and staking is something that can help. And Laura can address the whole issue of, you know, bending over and so forth, but it keeps the plants off the ground and it will also help with disease control. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our tomato diseases that we saw this year and how staking can also prevent them. There's a variety of different methods for staking, but if you saw that some of your plants were laying on the ground, they might've rotted or mice were eating them or rodents were eating them because they were so close to the ground, staking can definitely be a help here. Laura, did you want to say, say anything about staking? Okay. Now, weed control. Look out your garden right now. Look at the crabgrass, look at the quackgrass. Those are starting to drop seed and every one of those that drop seed are just going to provide more seed and more work for next year. So get rid of the weeds as often and as much as you possibly can. My rule of thumb is I can't get all the weeds by any means, but get those that are going to seed, even if that means I have to weed eat. And yes, I was weeding in my garden the other day because I couldn't keep up with it. And I just wanted to make sure I got all of the flowers knock down before they go to seed and then I just rake them out. So weed control is really, really critical 
Um, and like right now is a perfect time to get out there and start, you know, make sure crabgrass, goosegrass, all those summer grasses that have come up, they are dropping seeds and they will be a problem next year. In addition, uh, dead leafing, removing dead infected leaves. And again, I'm gonna talk about this when it comes to disease, and disease control. This is overwintering hiding places for many insect pests. So if your, your vegetables, your um, Brussels sprouts look like mine did here, um, this is again, do as I say, not as I do. Get rid of those dead leaves, the bad leaves, anything that doesn't look good and uh, is causing problems in the garden. Couple months ago, Jen um, talked about integrated pest management. And here are the components of integrated pest management. And I'm gonna be talking more about it tonight because integrated pest management is how we can address some of those problems that we had this past season. We have three control options for integrated pest management. In the middle here, you see cultural, biological, and chemical. And these three are the things that we use as our tools in the integrated pest management toolbox. Under cultural, that's our first choice and biological is our first choice. You may have to use chemicals, but if you do, there's certain ways that you can do it so that they are safe, they are um, easy to use. Cultural are the things I just talked about, sanitation, rotation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, traps, resistance, all those things that we can do that have nothing to do with pesticides, but we can do to hopefully prevent or minimize some of the problems next year. Same thing with biological. This is a great opportunity, especially during the winter. Look for any classes that people might have um, talking about predators or pathogens or anything that's a biological preventative or a control that might be able to help you in your garden. So biological is that second arm. And then of course, like I said, the third arm is chemical and chemicals can be used safely in the garden, providing you follow label directions. And I'll talk a little bit about that. With integrated pest management, these are the three key components. Know the plant, know the problem, determine op options. I'm gonna take a little side step right now and talk about fall army worms, which we are seeing right now throughout Ohio. We got an email from our crop specialist talking about them being in hay fields and in pastures. They're in turf, they're in lawns, and they have the potential and the capacity to kill everything overnight, or all your grass overnight, rather. And a lot of people are saying, you know, don't use pesticides, you know, don't use pesticides, don't put pesticides in the environment. Well, the simple challenge is that if you don't use pesticides to kill these caterpillars, they will eat your lawn and they'll continue to eat the lawn and the neighbor's lawns and the whole neighborhood is, as long as they have food. So pesticides are recommended. But the key is that you're using the right pesticide and that you know what the problem is. Rather than just going out, you have a green lawn going out and spraying, figure out if you actually have fall army room white net right now before you even use pesticides. Know the plant, the plant's turf grass in this case, know the problem, fall army room, but do you have it or do you not have it? If you have it, okay, it's okay to treat, use the right pesticides. But if you don't have it, why would you go out and put pesticides down just, just in case? And to find out if you have it, take a gallon of water, put two teaspoons full of um, Dawn dish soap or any kind of dish soap in there and just pour it like in a square foot area. If you have army worms, you're gonna flush them out. So if you find the small ones that are doing very little damage, you can treat them, but don't treat just because somebody said, oh, fall want army worms are out, they're killing lawns, you must spray. Know the plant, know the problem and determine your options. Here's another really good example. This is, any of you happen to see this, and I don't know why my video keeps kicking off. Did any of you happen to see this on your tomatoes this year, commonly on tomatoes, um, but you do see it sometimes on squash. So if you saw it on your tomatoes, yes or no, in the uh, chat box. No, 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 no. Good, good. Yes, some said yes. No, no, no. Chances are, if you haven't seen it this year, you may have seen it before. This is an abiotic or a non-living organism that causes this disease. In this case, it is lack of calcium in the plant. Okay, keep that in mind, lack of calcium in the plant. So I happened to be on social media and I saw somebody post a picture of the tomato with this. And boy, I, the, I was so disheartened by some of the comments that came out. 
First, spray the plant with blossom in rot spray. Second, give the plant Epsom salt. That's a common comment. You need to add calcium to your soil. In this case, know the plant, tomato or squash on the left. They're susceptible to blossom in rot. And what happens, the ends of the plants, the bloom in as you see here and here, the blossom in ends up rotting and turning black. You can still eat the tomato, the squash is not gonna develop, but you can still eat the tomato if you have that. It is indeed a lack of calcium in the soil, but spraying the plant with calcium, adding Epsom salt with the calcium, giving the salt, giving the blossom in rot spray on the plant, that's not gonna help. The problem is blossom in rot is caused by lack of calcium in the plant. If the soil is too moist or too dry, in other words, soil extremes, it can't be taken, calcium cannot be taken up by the plant. In other words, we have lots of calcium in our soil. There is no need to add calcium to the soil. The sprays don't work. Epsom salt doesn't work. The only way you know if you need calcium in your soil is if you do a soil test. With blossom in rot, when the soil, soil moisture is even, as I mentioned earlier, this disease won't occur. We tend to see this disease, and this year we saw it when we had a period of wet, wet weather consistently because the soil moisture was too wet. Well, you can't change that, but you can change it when the soil's too dry and calcium can't be taken up into the plant. So again, know the plant, know the problem, and know your options. Just don't go to the cupboard or, or don't listen to social media. Go to OSU Extension or some of your other educational sites and find out what causes blossom in rot and how do I remedy it in the most, the most appropriate method. Another option for cultural practices, resistant host plants. If you had tomatoes, for instance, and it was discovered that you had verticillium wilt, they were growing great and all of a sudden in the middle of the summer, they just wilted, you'd been watering, everything was appropriate, the plants were still green, they still looked good, but they just wilted. Well, there are resistant plants. If you see this um, V, F, or N on a tomato packet, as you see right here with this Roma tomato, it's V and F. V is verticillium wilt resistant, which is usually the disease that we see. Sometimes we see fusarium and sometimes we see nematodes. But the key is if you've had a disease or a pest problem, look and see if there are resistant plants. So again, identify the plant and identify the problem in order to select your options. These are cultural practices, no pesticides necessary, just making the decision to do and use the right plant. Rotate crops. And I think one of the questions we can get to towards the end, the questions that came in was about rotating crops. How do you rotate crops? Um, basically, if you have tomatoes and they do get verticillium wilt, you need to rotate out of there three to five years in order for that pathogen to die. So if you can, try not to use anything in that tomato or potato, the Solanaceae family in that area, because basically what happens, you put that same plant back in there time after time. If there is a soil borne pest, that population builds up because you're feeding them with the right plant. Eventually that population is going to cause problems. I use, um, I plant carrots. Carrots and wireworms, the little tiny worms, you need to pull the carrots, got all these little holes through it, and it's wireworms or potatoes. If you rotate those out of there for a few years, then the pest dies, the pest starves because it doesn't have anything to feed on. So crop rotation is a great cultural practice that you can use to try to avoid some pest problems. Traps, borders, barrier plants, are there problems you had this summer that maybe you could look at other plants that might attract either predators uh, tansy, for instance, attracts lots of predators, lots of uh, lady beetles, lots of parasitic wasps. So plant those things around the outside to attract predators and parasites or trap crops that will also take the insects away from the problem or the good plant and feed on the bad plant. Like in this case, nasturtiums, love, aphids love nasturtiums down here on the bottom left. They don't kill nasturtiums usually, but if you can attract them there, then maybe you can attract lady beetles to clean up the aphids. And if there's anything in the garden, they might be able to clean those up as well. You know, I always say if IPM were easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, we could just go grab a bottle of IPM off the shelf and spray and it would be perfect. We could do that. IPM is not easy. 
But once you learn about a specific pest problem, then you can figure out your options and your alternatives and you learn more about that each year in order to address that problem that you might have. Cultural practices, handpicking pests. Tomato hornworms are a common problem. I had a friend, he said he didn't have army worms in his lawn, but he's got lots of tomato hornworms. So he's been handpicking those because it's easy to handpick. They're so big, you could just pick them off. Another thing, plant earlier or later. If you had squash vine borer this year, look at your planting time. They tend to come out around the middle, to the first to the middle part of June, lay their eggs on the squash plant. The eggs are laid at the base of the plant. The larva hatch, they drill into the plant, the stem, and they feed and your plant wilts. Research has shown that if you plant later in the season so that your plants are not at that right stage, you know, nice thick stems for them to lay their eggs in, you can prevent squash vine borer. Uh, or you can plant earlier in the season and hopefully prevent them from laying because the plants are older. So again, when you have a pest, look it up, look up the fact sheet, and the fact sheet will give you multiple options of what you can do. And it'll start with your mechanical, your cultural options, biological options that might be available. And then of course, if you do need to end up taking some kind of strategy with spray, you'll have a chemical option available to you. Uh, plant earlier or later, I mentioned tolerate some damage. This is the brown marmorated stink bug. We've had it in Ohio for several years. It is a real problem on a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, Clark County is where I am, Springfield, Ohio. We don't have it really bad, but I do have it in my tomatoes and I tolerate some damage. Instead of spraying, I tolerate damage. So in the upper left-hand corner, here is one of my yellow tomatoes. You can see these little spots right here. This is the feeding damage when brown marmorated stink bugs are young. This is the feeding damage that they do. They come out and they just kind of pierce and suck the juices and leave these little, you're looking at these little tiny light spots like somebody might have uh, nicked it or bumped it and bruised it. However, those spots will turn into dead areas. As you can see here on this one, the um, brown spots are the same here that just started to dry out and die. And then eventually they can end up like this because that dead tissue starts dying. Now I can still use this. It's still safe to eat. It's not a problem. It does decrease the quality of my tomatoes. So if I'm a grower, commercial grower, I'm definitely gonna take action and I can't afford to put that out on the shelf because you're not gonna buy it. But in my own vegetable garden, I tolerate this damage. So I don't worry about it. I cut it off. I might use twice as many tomatoes to get my salsa made or canned tomatoes but I don't have to go out and spray because I, in this case, I'm tolerating the damage on this particular um, problem. Right now, we're gonna start looking, not now, maybe in about another month, we'll start looking at fall garden cleanup. And I have already talked about eliminating weeds. I cannot stress this enough. It's absolutely a must that you get out there and you start pulling those weeds. Again, focusing on those that are going to seed right now. Pest hiding places. Uh, I'm very guilty of this. I will pull weeds and put them in a pile and then I will kind of leave them there until I either get on the tractor or my husband gets the tractor out and we go around and pick up all these piles. In fact, Laura, I've got a few piles in my landscape right now of weeds that when I go out and lift them under the tractor, I'm gonna make sure I bend my knees and lift them with my pitchfork and put them on the tractor right. Because again, Laura has been a, a huge influence on me this summer. Uh, so eliminate those hiding places because if I leave them there all winter, they're just they're just going to be places for some pests to overwinter. And then eliminate debris as much as possible. So yes, do as I say, not as I do. This is from one of the leaf spot diseases that tomatoes get during the season. This was a great year for leaf spot because we had the right temperatures, the right moisture consistency. You can see a little bit on this one right here of the spots. This was bacterial spot. And you can see all of these leaves have died because of that. And typically there's bacterial spot, bacterial spot, um, early blight, and some other leaf spot diseases that are very common on tomatoes. Now, if you think about tomatoes and the disease triangle, there's three things that need to come to, into play for that triangle. Number one is the host plant. In this case, I've got tomatoes. Number two in the pathogen. Pathogens are out there, they're everywhere. And then number three is the environment. Some of these, these diseases prefer cool nights in the 50s, some prefer them in the 60s. The biggest thing for most of these is moisture or heavy dew. 
So when we talk about avoid overwatering at night, that's one of the reasons why I keep the leaf surface dried. But the reality is we live in Ohio. And if you've noticed the last several nights for about the last month, we've had heavy dews. So that moisture on that leaf surface overnight allows that pathogen to germinate and start to grow and cause this problem. There are some fungicide sprays that if you wanna spray, you can do that, but you gotta get it early before the symptoms show up. Once you see this, it's too late to recover these leaves, but you can prevent the new growth from being diseased. Um, but the biggest thing right here is all of these leaves that are laying on the ground, all of these leaves that are right here, this leaf right here, and probably some of these that aren't showing symptoms yet have pathogens for next year. So if I'm going to plant tomatoes back in this bed, and if I don't clean that up, I'm definitely gonna have potential for leaf spot diseases next year. So I, I pull these up, I may compost them, I may just destroy them, burn them, or put them in the trash and uh, eliminate them that way. But that is potential pathogen. That's why we want to eliminate that debris because that's the pathogen on those overwintered leaves for next year. Now, keep in mind, this is a caveat here, even though you clean up every single disease or every single leaf out there and you get it just scrubbed down and you've got every single one, this is a disease that is so common in Ohio and we have the perfect environmental conditions almost every year that you may see this in some cases almost yearly. So it's again, understanding this disease, understanding its life cycle and understanding how to manage them is the best way to attack them. Composting, I mentioned compost a little bit earlier, composting. So there are different types, different ways to compost. And I'll just go into this briefly because of time. Um, I mentioned, you know, putting those disease leaves in the compost pile. Now, yes, if I don't heat my compost up enough above 140 degrees, I am not gonna kill that pathogen. However, in a home composting situation, it's very unlikely that I'm going to get all pathogens eliminated. So basically I will compost, but I may not use that compost back in my vegetable garden because I had vegetable tomatoes, all those leaves that were diseased in there. So I may put that out in the front yard in my perennial garden, but I will utilize it anyways. Um, because you have to really get that, path. if you have a pathogen or insect, you've got to get that compost up heated throughout the entire pile. And that's almost next to impossible in a home garden situation. Um, you can buy bag compost. That's, you know, that's great if you have the money and you have a smaller area to use it in, that's fine. Um, but if you have a larger area or you have the capacity to compost, it truly is black gold. It absolutely just makes gardening, um, makes the soil so much better. It improves the, the structure of the soil, which adds good drainage, adds good air spaces, and also adds that water holding capacity if you have sandy soils. Um, on the top right, you have an area where this was at our display gardens. We have plenty of area, so we can afford to do this. And we've got the three bend system. And down on the bottom right is a smaller area of the three bend system. And basically the first bend, you put all your raw material that you bring out of the garden and drop it here. And then after a few weeks, you'll turn it and dump it here. And then after a longer period of time, you'll turn it and dump it here. So you can see that we've been turning these three piles consistently to get that nice compost that we'll put back into the garden. You know, this is great if you have a tractor. I mean, for me, I just have one large pile because I've got five acres. I can just dump it in a big pile, turn it periodically. Whenever I get compost, that's great. I'm not worried about how fast I get it, but I use it when I get it. If you don't have a lot of space, there are some home composters like these on the bottom left. Um, you can use these, obviously they're smaller, so you're not gonna have a lot of space with them. Um, but you know, they're good for composting. Now the key to compost, composting is kind of an art and science. You know, you've got your materials, your carbon materials, your wood materials, your dried leaves, you've got your nitrogen materials, your fresh grass, fresh lawn clippings, or your tomatoes that are coming out of the garden, still green. And then you've got your bacteria, even in the soil, there's bacteria. There's no need to go out and buy a gallon of bacteria to add to it. It's expensive and you don't need it. Just go get a, a cup or a quart or a gallon bucket of soil and put it in there because that's where you get those microorganisms, a little bit of moisture, and then the turning for the aeration, and you can create your own compost. In this case, top right corner, it's a slower period, slower time. It takes almost a year to two years to get this final compost. Down here on the bottom, when you have less space, 
you can do it over a year period or you can do it quickly. There are compost turners that you can do it within 14, 10 to 14 days. Now, the key is you chop up all the materials finely because the less surface space for the microbes to feed on, the less time it takes. If you got big branches, it's gonna take longer to break them down. So the smaller the particles, the faster you can go. And the more accurate your carbon to nitrogen ratio is, the faster it's going to compost. So a lazy composter is fine like me, or if you really want to learn how to compost, there's lots of information out there in terms of how to get all the combination, that art part of it just right so that you can have great compost. Fall is a great time to compost. We try to collect our grass clippings. We try to collect our leaves. We put them in the compost pile because that adds the carbon and nitrogen. Um, it's a great time to build it. You'll notice that if you build it properly, you can get that inner part up to 120, 140 degrees. But the problem is when you start turning it, if there's not enough material in that center to get it up to that, that temperature, you're not going to get it clear throughout that entire compost pile. So that's where your organisms aren't going to all be killed. But still, the benefits of using compost out far outweigh not doing it. Another thing that I do that I, I, first time I did it last year and I am sold, I mean, I absolutely am totally sold on this and that's plant a cover crop. And last year I, I went to a program and I did, um, I used um, oats and red clover and I went online, bought my oats and red clover up here in the right hand corner. You can see the oats and red clover. I mixed them together. I had to do my math so I get the right amount per square foot. I had a space where I had, this is where my tomatoes were last year and they just looked horrible by about right now. So I think it was actually the middle of September when I seeded this, I tilled it up, I raked it out, kind of got it you know, leveled and ready to go. I put the seed down according to appropriate directions and then I just kind of lightly raked it. I didn't have to cover anything. I just kind of lightly raked that area in. And I will tell you this year, that soil has been fabulous. The seed will germinate, depending on what you're using, the seed will germinate in the fall, and then it'll just kind of set there over the winter, and then it'll start to grow a little bit in the spring. But before you start using it in the spring, you hit it with like a glyphosate or something that kills it completely. You turn it under after it dies, and it added an incredible amount of organic matter to my soil that it was even easier to pull weeds this year. I planted onions and peppers in that, or onions and potatoes in that area. And I really couldn't believe the difference in just one year of using that cover crop. So I'm definitely going to be doing cover crops every year now. The problem is you've got to get it planted. Usually mid-September is getting kind of late because you want to get it germinated and up and growing before you get cold weather. Um, so if you have plants still in the garden, which I have plants still out there, but I do have a couple areas that I've cleaned out some old broccoli and some old plants. I will clean that up. So right now my plan is to kind of like do four corners. I will rotate where I put my cover crops in uh, because I'm, I'm a firm believer now in cover crops after using it after one year. I mentioned biological pra practices, biological predators, parasites, and pathogens. Down on the bottom is that tomato hornworm. These white casings are the pupil cases of the um, parasite, the predator rather, it's a, a wasp that lays its eggs on the caterpillar. They hatch, they go inside the caterpillar, eat the guts out, the guts die, they pupate, and these are the white pupil cases, and then they start to grow, uh, or they start their life cycle over again, so they'll be around again. If you see this on your plants, this is something you don't wanna do anything, just let it go, because this is actually gonna be good for the garden. Um, as I said, we're going into winter, look for classes, or this is a great time to start learning about some of these predators, parasites, and pathogens. On the right upper corner, I have a picture of lacewing larva. Um, this is the larva, this little tiny brown thing on here. This is the adult of the lacewing. And right on this picture right here, these little tiny white eggs are on really thin filaments. They actually are on a pine tree. They will eat aphids and other soft bodied insects. Um, I had them several years, I had aphids several years ago on my tomatoes. I looked around, kind of inspected, and I found these larvae, or these eggs rather, on my tomato steaks. So I thought, well, I'm just gonna leave them alone. In a couple of weeks, they'd hatched and the aphids were gone. So learning how to identify them is really important. And then again, providing that habitat, that food source, 
or soft or a plant attractant plants, things that bring them in. Like I mentioned, tansy. My perennial garden is right beside my vegetable garden so that I have a food source for some of these predators to come in and survive and then they'll clean up the vegetable garden when needed. Um, I mentioned soft pesticides and that's in quote. They are pesticides such as soaps, oils, horticultural oils, and um, bacteria thuringiensis because these things are very safe to use. They don't kill everything. They're not broad spectrum. So they will not kill the predators. They will not kill the good guys. They'll kill the bad guys. So when you're going to select an insecticide, know which one to select that's going to be the least damaging to everything else. Um, Oregon State University has uh, plants that encourage beneficial insects in your garden. So you can just Google this and you'll find it. Here are the list of plants, carrots, anise, blue lace, caraway, dill. Of course, we know dill, lady beetles, hoverflies. There's a lot more biological predators out there than just lady beetles uh, and the surfed flies and so forth. So all of these different predators here, here's the types of plants that you might wanna use. And as I said, I put these near my vegetable garden so that I can provide that beneficial or beneficial plant for those plants that like to come in and feed on the bad guys. Now, not everybody wants to use chemicals. I know a lot of people, when I was talking about the fall armyworm situation, a lot of people are talking, oh, I don't wanna kill, you know, I don't wanna kill the bees and so forth. I, I don't wanna use chemicals. Well, if you don't use chemicals in that case, you will probably have a struggle getting your lawn to grow again, because if not, like I said, they'll just keep eating. So there are times that you may have to select a chemical product. It's the last choice. You've gone through, look at all the problems you had this summer, learn about them and select what's needed. If you can't do it culturally, biologically, then it's your last choice. Know the life cycle of the pest. Like I said, if the army worms aren't there in February, March, April, May, June, why would you spray? Spray and target them at the right particular time. Use the least toxic for the pests, as I mentioned, safe or us, uh, you know, the softer insecticides. Use things that are the least toxic for that pest in question. Don't do this broad spectrum. I'm going to spray everything and kill everything. And then store properly if you're going to buy chemicals. And this is one of the things I think people, they make the mistake of buying gallons. It's cheaper to buy a gallon than it is to buy a quart or ready to use. Buy just what you need. And Laura, I think you were going to say something about storing. Yes, I was. Please, please keep them in their labeled bottles. If you need to put them in something else, put a label on it. Because Pam had said she gets a few calls, I don't know, a week, a month, a year. So I got this white bottle, this clear bottle full of something yellow. What is that? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's not not safe to have those things. My, our colleague, Kent McGuire, does safety inspections on campus. And he's had any number of times where he's gone to a lab where the professor has been there for decades. He retires and there are buckets and bottles and so many unidentified products around and a lot of them are poisonous. Also, please store them properly. Keep them up high if there is any chance whatsoever, if there's not even a chance, that someone could get into this bottle, store it up high. It shouldn't be out where it would be easy for a child to get. Or if you have a neighbor or a family member or a friend who has maybe memory issues or poor eyesight, it would be really easy to grab the wrong bottle and either kill all your plants or harm yourself because you've spilled it on your skin and you don't know how to um, properly clean it off. So please leave them in the bottles whenever possible. And if not, please, please put a label on them so you know what it is, because you're not going to remember what's in there in a year or a couple months even. Yeah, right. Safe. Pesticides safe. are safe to use, but the biggest thing is follow the label, read the label. Um, with the products right now that we're recommending for army worm, a lot of people are concerned about honeybees. Well, if you don't have any clover blooming, there are no honeybees foraging in the lawns right now. So using that pesticide in the lawn because it's targeted on the lawn is not gonna kill honeybees. So that label, while it may be long, it's kind of like, you know, when you get the, the VCRs years ago, you'd open it up and then you get these directions that are like, ah, that label is there for a reason. And that label is a pesticide is a law. You follow that label, pesticides are very safe to use. 
All right, fall garden cleanup. So, you know, if you're at the point like right now this week, my tomatoes are almost all, <laughs> no leaves left. The tomatoes are starting to ripen. I got quite a few on the vine. So they're at the point now where I'm just gonna clean them up and pull the tomatoes out. And in that area, I'll be able to plant a cover crop. So anything that looks really bad right now or has done is past season, past prime, pull it out and either compost or destroy it, depending on what your choice is. Add your soil amendments if you're going to add organic matter. Fall's a good time to do that. Or as I mentioned, plant to cover crop. Put away your materials, your, your staking material, your fabric, your plastic. It's going to last longer. Hoses, I don't know how many times I see people store, you know, keep hoses just laying out in the lawn in the winter. I wrap mine up and store them every year in a container that's not going to be, you know, it's out of the sun, out of the cold. Uh, put away your drip hoses, soaker, drip irrigation. In other words, put everything away for this season. Some people like to till in the fall. I will go in and till areas that are kind of still weedy. I'll try to, you know, eliminate the weeds first, particularly those going to seed, and then I'll till that under prior to planting um, my um, cover crop. And then again, a journal. Now I don't have a journal, I don't have it with me right now, but I used a three ring binder. And then I use page protectors inside that binder. And when I plant seeds, when I take a seed packet and I empty it out, I'll stick it in that binder so that next year when I get ready to buy my seeds, I remember, oh yeah, I like that particular variety. That was a good one to use. So I have that seed packet right there. Or I might even have seeds that I didn't use so I can put them in there and then use those the next season if they're still viable. Put your notes in there right now. Again, it doesn't have to be a journal, just a three ring binder with some paper in there. I try to stick everything in there just to kind of keep track so that the next year, okay, where did I plant my tomatoes? Where did I plant my potatoes? And I have kind of a rough diagram of where everything goes. Laura? Just to follow up with Pam said, it's really easy right now when it's fresh in your mind, write it down. I have three ring binders. I have one full of knitting patterns that I print off and another several full of recipes that I print off. Um, write those things down. So what was the best part? What worked really well, whether it was the plants or Pam stretching and safe lifting, very helpful. And, but if that's not something you've been doing for years and years, you're probably gonna forget about it when you're excited to get back out in the spring. So write those, write down what, I always like to start from this point of strength, what worked really well? What did I really, really like? I wore my sun hat, I wore my sunglasses, I was careful. If I'm watering plants, I get up earlier than I want to and I go and water them because I don't want to do it midday. And I know this, write these things down. And then if there was things that were hard, it was really hard for me to get to, it was, it's harder for me to get down into the ground. So now is when you start thinking, maybe I do need to raise those up. Maybe I need a raised bed. Maybe I just need some vertical, some poles with some hog panel up and I will find some baskets to hang it so that I have a vertical garden. Those are the things to write down. We don't wanna focus on the negative, but just say, it was really hard for me to get down on the ground. It was really hard for me to spend all this time tending this high maintenance plant it was whatever it was, write it down because you're not going to forget. You're just going to be excited in the spring and ready to get back out. So what would you like to change? Um, I want to keep stretching and I want to keep, I want to keep stretching. I want to keep going out early. I want to keep wearing my sun protection. I want more vertical gardens. I want to quit um, doing this thing or that thing. So now is the time to think about it. I mean, it gives you time to plan over the few months to decide where to spend your money. Decide if there's something you want to get built or build yourself. It's all ready so that in the spring when you can start, you hit the ground running and write it all down in your journal or your binder or wherever you write it. I like to write stuff down too. So keep track of all that. Think about what went well, what didn't go as well, and, and put it down so you don't have to try to remember it. Okay, now we're going to go to phenology. And I was just looking up the uh, fact sheet for soil testing. Leo, somebody had a question. If you would uh, go to Ohio line and look up soil test fact sheet and provide that, that would be really helpful. I wasn't able to put my hands on it right away. Um, so plant phenology. So phenology is the study of events, plants and animals in response to seasonal and climate changes. So basically, 
we watch um, as the spring and summer start to develop, we watch through growing degree days. And typically there are plants in flower about the same time that certain insects are coming out. I'm not gonna go into phenology in detail tonight, but if you're interested, go to this website, phenology.osu.edu and learn more about plant phenology. But in this case, you're seeing a list. This is a, the, our website on plant phenology. You see the numbers, they're growing degree days. And you see in black, that's when these certain insects hatch. Well, potato leaf hopper comes in about the time sweet bag, sweet bay magnolia is at first bloom. So basically in a nutshell, we are looking at plant development and comparing it to insect development. And over the years, Dan Herms and some other researchers up in Worcester have determined that there's a lot of correlation between plant development and insect development. And we know that also in terms of um, and other animals as well. So there's a couple websites that you'll find that have some information on plant phenology. And this is just a list of some of the things that I was able to find. Um, plant peas when forsythia blooms. Basically when forsythia blooms at that same time, soil temperatures are around 60 degrees, 56 to 60 degrees overnight at the depth of four inches. That's a good time to plant peas. We also know that about that time when forsythia blooms, crab apple or crabgrass seeds rather start to germinate. So all these correlations have been made over many years and they seem to be very reliable. Potatoes when the first dandelion blooms, uh, beets and carrots, corn. So all of these basically are related to the time of the year in terms of the best time to plant, but they're also at the same time when these plants are coming out or in flower. So plant phenology is just a, a really fascinating subject that you might want to look into just to learn. And instead of, you know, trying to figure out on your calendar, just look outside. We know that when the red buds bloom, gypsy moth larvae are hatching. So if you're going to be spraying for gypsy moth larvae, that would be the time to hit them about when the red buds bloom. So try looking into plant phenology and getting a little more information. Here's another really good one. And I mentioned the squash vine borer. Chicory is a summer blooming indicator plant. When the flowers first open, that's the time to start spraying or preventing damage from the squash vine borer. The other thing you can do instead of spraying, you can also cover your plants with row covers. Now the downside to that is squash is pollinated by insects. So if you cover it and don't have insects doing the pollination, you are going to prevent pollination. So you have to kind of time it so that if you're gonna cover it, you make sure there's, you know, they're not in full bloom, which goes back to my planting a little bit later in the season so that they're not in full bloom at the time the adult larvae from squash vine borer are out and feeding. Finally, there's lots of help available. Um, programs like this, your, your county extension office may do a program in specific, specifically. If you wanna to talk to your county office, if you do extension.osu.edu slash, and then put your county in there, Franklin, Clark, Pickering, or, or uh, Washington, any of the counties, put those in there and you will go to your local county website. That's where you can learn about the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, as well as what kind of services they offer. The Buckeye Yard and Garden Line is another great resource. We have a Facebook page. It's also at beagle.osu.edu. And if you suspect you have armyworms, uh, Joe Boggs, Curtis Young, and Dave Shetler just posted a great article about what to do. Ohio Line is where Leo just found, hopefully found the fact sheet for soil testing. And that's where you'll find a lot of other fact sheets available as well. And then one of the sites that I like to use, and I use it quite a bit, is the Cornell Home Gardening site. And this is a long link right here. All you have to do is um, go and, and uh, Google Cornell Home Gardening, and you can get to that site to find out their information. So they've got lots of great information on pests as well as uh, vegetables. And then if you really have a problem and you're not sure what to do, you can always use Ask a Master Gardener. So it's at the mastergardener.osu.edu website. But even if you go to your county website, there is a place, a little tab on there that says ask, ask an expert and you can ask the master gardener and they will answer your questions about backyard gardening questions. And they do a great job and they usually do it within um, 48 hours in terms of answering that question. 
Keep in mind that when you are asking questions, the more information you give us, the easier it is for us to help you diagnose that problem. Um, we need as much detail as possible. And if you send a picture in, you can attach pictures to this website, send good pictures, clear pictures, show us the insect, the disease, whatever you're looking at, and then also step back and show us the big picture. If we just see a little tiny spot on a leaf, that perspective is very difficult to um, you know, put into that whole big concept. So send us as much good information as you possibly can. So we have, I have a lot of resources on the Ohio AgriBuilding website. Leo just put this link into the chat box. But when you go into that, it lists, it has videos from past mm -hmm. webinars. Um, like Leo said, we still have to process all the captioning. So that will be up for this video and all of the different videos sorry, all the webinars we've done for this. I have all the handouts. We didn't really mention the tools handout today, but I've made a handout with a uh, three or four page handout with a lot of different tools that I recommend. Um, we have some on some kitchen gadgets from July when we did the canning and preserving. So go to that webinar. There's a lot of great information. And of course, there's a lot of great information about Ohio AgriBuilding, which is a tremendous program anyway. I'm very proud of it. Um, we've got 32 fact sheets. They're all about farming and gardening with a disability. We have some with specific disabilities, and there's quite a bit about preventing, preventing injury uh, because AgriBuilty is in the agricultural safety and health team. Have a lot of handouts. And also um, we have a whole section on caregivers. Caregiver Support Network comes out of Ohio AgriBuilty. So we've had a lot of webinars on that. In the last year and a half, we're having a mental health caregivers and mental health webinar in October. So all that information is on the Ohio AgriBuilding website. Once you get to the agribility.osu.edu, you'll see the links up there and you can see where that is. Okay, so we are now at the point where um, we have a few questions. Kathy Zeltner, I'm going to allow you to talk if you want to ask your question. You had a hand up. Kathy, if you can, there you go. Kathy, if you want to unmute, there you go. Okay. I did not mean to put my hand up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's I must okay. <laughs> All right, no problem. Uh, Leo, do you want to ask me a few of the questions? Uh, Laura and I, a few of the questions that came in. Yeah, let me uh, just pull in something else. Oh. Did you have them handy? Yeah, what, I know about one of the soil testing. Where do you yeah, set, so how do you do that? Leo put the soil test fact sheet up. One of the keys with soil testing, and when you're going to do this, think about what crop you're growing. If you were going to test for lawns, you're just going to test in the yard for lawns. If you're going to plant trees or shrubs, you're just going to want to plant trees or shrubs. In the vegetable garden, which is the one place that I would strongly urge you to test, because you're taking vegetables out every year, much like a farmer's taking a crop out every year. So you are removing nutrients. In a vegetable garden, you want to go and take a core, maybe about four to six inches deep, because that's where your soil roots or your roots are from the plants. Take a core in 15 different spots, random spots around the garden. Don't take just one spot because all you're going to get is that one. So you want to take 15 shovelfuls, put in a bucket and stir it up really good take a cup out and that's what you send in to be sampled. The, the fact sheet there has the labs that you can send them to. I do like Penn State's lab and I like Michigan, excuse me, Michigan State's lab. They do a good job with their samples, sending them, sending the information back. And it gives you information on what you should add. If you're going to plant a lawn, then you can check I'm planting lawns. This is what, you know, I need to know, do I have the right components for a lawn? But you're doing a vegetable garden, Make sure you check vegetable garden, general crops, vegetable garden crops, and get that information um, on the, the sheet that you send in to get your um, soil tested. Now, the way I look at soil testing, most backyard gardeners don't do it until they have a problem. It's, it's a good idea to do it at least once every three or four years just to have an idea, or at least once so you have a benchmark of where your garden soil is. A farmer's going to do it all the time because they want to minimize inputs, fertilizers, and so forth. 
and maximize outputs. Their living depends on that soil. In a backyard garden, we don't so much, you know, depend on the soil. However, when there's a problem, that's one of the areas that people start blaming without really knowing what's going on. So instead of adding fertilizer, adding nutrients to the soil without knowing what you need, do a soil test. And that fact sheet will explain to you exactly how to do that soil test. Concerning plant rotation, is it better to keep plant families in the same in each raised bed? No, you wanna rotate out of plant families. So potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, those in the Solanaceae family, rotate out of there. So don't put them. Now, here's the challenge. I, I, I realize it sounds like it's a great thing to do, but at my old house, I had a garden that was eight by 24 feet. So, you know, if I have eight foot of tomatoes and eight foot of uh, squash and eight foot of something else, rotating out is rather difficult. So I did the best I could. If you have a small area, do the best you can. Try not to plant, at least for a year, try not to plant the same crop back in there. If you can go longer, that's great too. But you wanna stay out of that same family as much as you possibly can. Potatoes, carrots, and root crops, if you've had wireworm, keep them out of that area for a good three years if possible to uh, prevent um, wireworms from continuing to grow. Uh, is it enough to rotate tomato peppers to last year's home? Yes, rotate the tomato and peppers to last year's home of where the green beans were, for instance. Um, so just keep the families out of there as much as you can. Your squash, your cucurbits, cucumber, zucchini, rotate those into the tomato spot. So again, that's where a journal would be really helpful in terms of being able to know what I put where. Uh, let's see, there's the survey link, Leo submitted questions. Elevated garden beds, do they need to be covered or any special treatment? Absolutely not. The only thing you might consider doing is adding organic matter to it if you think you need that. You could put a cover crop in very easily. Um, the only thing you'd want to do is if you have rhubarb or a perennial crop like asparagus in there, you might want to kind of protect the sides from freezing. But if you're just planting lettuce, of a dead garden, so that's not necessary. Compost pile using the recommended ratio of brown and green. Addison compost from a garden store for soil layers. Try to keep it moist, but it's not getting warm or hot inside. It's a three foot raised bed, two and two and a half feet five. Last month I had a Joe's compost start. Any suggestion on how to get it going? Okay. So when you're composting, minimum three by three by three. So you have to have that minimum cubic footage up to a maximum in a backyard garden of five by five by five. If you get larger in a pile like the commercial places, you have to turn it on a regular basis or it gets too hot. That internal temperature gets so hot that it kills microorganisms. If it's not high enough, it doesn't get hot enough for the microorganisms to start to act. So that is one, um, um, one thing to think about. Now, if you did the ratio of brown to green, the 30 to one ratio, I find it's just as easy to do a four inch layer of brown stuff, a four inch layer of green stuff, um, a layer of maybe some already finished compost, a little bit of fertilizer, which is high in nitrogen because that adds nutrients for the microorganisms, especially if you don't have enough green stuff, and then water that to the, the um, feeling of a damp sponge then do it again and then do it again and keep layering like that up until you get uh, three to five feet high in a home garden situation and three to five feet wide. Um, not getting warm tells you you did not have the right components in the right mix and everything, you know, just perfect. Because if, if you do it the way I just mentioned, you can get it up in the next couple of days within that 140, 130 temperature range. Um, so Doug, if you, if you start over, Start with that instead of going, I know a lot of people think 30 to one carbon to nitrogen, um, it's hard to achieve that. So by doing four inches of green stuff, four inches of brown stuff and making a layer like that and moisture each layer and then turning it at, you know, what I do is stick the compost thermometer in there. I'll see it go up for a few days. And then when it starts to go back down, that means that those microorganisms have finished working on that center of the pile. They're starting to move out of the pile then I'll turn it again. You'll get an increase 
then it goes back down, then you turn it again, you'll get an increase, but you'll start seeing that you're not going to get that much of an increase because you don't have enough stuff for them to start feeding on in the middle of that pile. So I hope that helps. Suzanne, in both vegetable gardens and perennial gardens, should you remove dead leaves and branches to prevent pests, disease or pests? So Suzanne, this only depends on what disease or what insect problem you're dealing with. Um, in your vegetable garden, like for instance, uh, asparagus, I don't remove those because it's recommended to leave your fronds over the winter months, so I don't remove those until spring. Everything else in my vegetable garden, since it is an annual, it has no benefit for anything overwintering. I get it out of there because if I don't get it right now in the fall, I don't have time in spring because I've got everything else going on. In the perennial gardens, a lot of people are starting to leave things like cone flowers and those with like woody stems for the overwintering um, bees and the bee larva to use as an overwintering home. So some people are doing that. Uh, some recommendations are to leave them for a couple years and then just let the, the new growth come in and cover that up. So it all depends on the pest or disease that you're dealing with. For instance, in peonies, I get the black spot on them, the little brown blotches, the helmisporium or no, uh, cladosporium leaf spot on them, they, the purple big black brown blotches. By leaving that, that just leaves that pathogen then for next year. So I remove everything on those. So it just depends on what plant you have and what problem you're dealing with. Hostas, for instance, they get all mushy and look horrible and they really don't have any benefit. I remove them completely. So it just depends on the particular plant. What would be the best winter ground cover for small raised beds if you're looking at a cover crop? I, Leo, I have not tried any other cover crops, but I absolutely am a big fan of oats and red clover. I just was so impressed with what it did last year. My cherry tomatoes were very small this year. I will test the soil. Do you know what causes them to be so small? That's not happened before. Uh, Suzanne, it also depends on what variety. Did you get the same variety? Because there's all different. I mean, like the, the one that's the, oh, I can't think of a million something or other. They're really tiny. And then there's your grape tomatoes. And then there's sun gold. There's all different sizes. So that could be one thing. Um, if they were all consistently the same size, then it, it could be from lack of fertilizer, that's very possible. Uh, or watering, did you have enough water or moisture during the season? Wendy said, the survey will not let me finish because I did not attend the other seminars. Leo said, he'll fix it. What is the ratio with your oats and red clover? And Cheryl, I'm gonna have to look that up um, because I do not, well, I followed, when I did that, I followed the label. So I don't have a label handy. I'll have to go back to the label, but it tells you how many pounds um, per square foot to use. And that's what I did, I think. I don't, I'm gonna have to look that up. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, but somewhere I found that information either at a cover crop site or where I, I think I might've found it from where I purchased the cover crops, so. I'm sorry, I can't give you an exact answer on that. Leo or Laura, is there anything else you want to talk about? No. Thank you for joining us. This has been, last year we did one seminar and this year we did five. So I think five is our maximum, but look forward to more seminars next year for sure. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. Thank you for coming, and please uh, remember to fill out the survey. The QR code on the screen will take you to the survey on your phone if you want to point your camera in that direction, or you can use the link that was provided in chat a little earlier. Uh, if necessary, I can grab that again. But uh, I fixed the survey so that there was a problem with one of the questions. You should not have any problem with that now. Uh, yes, and stay tuned. You'll receive an email from me in the near future when uh, when the video series is available for you to view online. Uh, right now, parts one and two are available. Uh, let me go ahead and grab that link for you in case you would like to check those out. Plant, we did planning and planting your vegetable garden. I got super inspired by 
my fabulous colleagues this year that I built a uh, raised bed just for vegetable gardening and have had a blast with it. Um, yes, there's Pam's uh, email, bennett.27 at osu.edu. Yeah, Cheryl, if you want to email me, I will try to find out, or if anybody else wants to email for specific questions, I'll be glad to help you out. Because I've got to find out so I can plan it again properly this year. <laughs>